If you have your Bibles this morning, please turn with me to uh, the book of Hebrews. If you remember last week, we began speaking about faith, about faith. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, it's a scripture that we all are probably very familiar with. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance, last week I said it was substance and evidence. When we talk about faith, we talk about things that we, believing in things that we can't see. I believe in God. I've never seen God. I've never seen God. Uh, but I believe in him. But just believing in him isn't really the same thing as having faith in him. Okay. You might believe there's a God. There's a lot of people who believe in some kind of God. But do they have faith in him? Okay. Faith, we said last week, faith should have substance, like stuff. Even though I'm believing in something I can't see, my faith ought to be something I can grab a hold of. Because it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or proof of things not seen. I said, I th think it was last week, or I've preached this a couple times this week, but, you know, the last time I was down Westmoreland County Jail, I used the scripture, and I said, you know what evidence is, and all them guys knew what evidence was. <laughs> you know, all them guys, they, they, uh, it's evidence, it's proof. Your faith ought to have proof. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, a lot of people call that the faith hall of fame, okay, hall of fame. And there are a number of individuals mentioned in that chapter that the author of Hebrews holds out as an example of saving faith. Saving faith, okay? Now, when I used to work for Allegheny Ludlam Steel Corporation, okay, there was a time, and I know Zora remember this because he worked there too, uh, there was a time when they, were, they, they weren't doing so well. And they, st they wanted to call every, all the workers in to have a meeting with them. You remember that? They called us all down the Allegiant down there in groups of like maybe 100 guys at a time. And we went down there, and the president of the company was there, and uh, there were other officials there. And they went through the things they'd done right and the things they'd done wrong and all this. And then they said, then they would show you pictures of factories of competing companies. Now, Allegheny Ludlam is an old steel mill. This is a message about Allegheny Ludlam, but it's an old steel mill. And they got a factory in Brackenridge, and they got one out in Vandergriff, and they got one out in Leechburg, and they got one in Baghdad, and they got one in Ohio, and they got them all over the place, right? So they showed a picture of a new steel mill that some factory built down in Kentucky. And it was just like everything that was in one place, okay? And they said, that's what we want to look like. Do you remember that? They said, this is, this is what we want to look like. And they, and they talked about how they did things in that company. And they said, this is what we want to look like. Hebrews chapter 11 is what we want to look like. If you want to know what faith is, if you want to know what being a Christian is, take a good look at Hebrews chapter 11. Because our faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Things that we can't see. Things that we can only hope for. And when we talk about hoping, again, remember I said that hope isn't an uncertainty. That's a certainty. I'm hoping for the return of Jesus Christ. I know he's coming back. I have hope. That's, the Bible calls that my blessed hope. This world is not my home. I know I have a promise of a resurrected body. I know I have a promise of absent from the body, present with the Lord. These are all promises that have, I have not seen happen yet, but I know they're going to happen. And because I have faith in what God's word says, my faith has substance and it's evidence. It's proof. Now we're going to be doing this morning, and maybe, I'm probably not going to finish, maybe next week too, is we're going to be looking at how, what we should look like as believers. Is that all right? And you can... Judge yourself. You know, the world tells us what we ought to look like. Uh, I, know, I know guys that I go down the Y, okay? And there's some guys down there that are real serious about it. You know what I'm talking about? And they'll look at, they'll look at these muscle magazines and they'll say, guys, you know, 
And they'll say, I want to look like that. Yeah, steroids. <laughs> they'll say, I want to look like that. You know, guys with the... I gave up wanting that a long time ago. They say, I want to look like that. You know, uh, our young women are being plied. They, they see these beauty magazines and say, I want to look like that. And they end up starving themselves thinking it's going to make them look like that. The Bible tells us what we ought to look like. And in Hebrews chapter 11, the author gives us examples of what we should look like as Christians. And not a single one here. He doesn't talk about Peter or Paul or James or John or New Testament. He doesn't talk about John the Baptist. It doesn't talk about people. He talks about people from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis, from way back. Because salvation is the same in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. We're saved by what? Faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what saves us. So it says in Hebrews chapter 11... That faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, in verse 2, the elders obtained a good report. We can read some good things about these people we're going to read about right here. Why? Because they believed God. They believed God and it was counted to them for righteousness. God accepted them because they believed what he said. Now these elders in the Old Testament, they didn't know about the cross. They didn't know the details about the atonement and the, the, the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ. They didn't understand all that. They understood that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. They understood that. But they didn't know all the details of New Testament theology, yet they believed God, what God had told them. Now listen to what it says. We're going to kind of take a survey this morning. And we're going to see what your faith looks like. In my faith. It says in verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. There are people today who are Christians and claim to be Christian and I, I don't know who say they're, they're Christians, but they say, well, you know, I believe in evolution. I have a real hard time with plugging those two things together. Because it says right here, if, if, if I'm to read the, first, the very first book of the Bible, the very first two or three chapters, it says, God created everything in six days. They'll scoff at that. The, the, the people that deny the existence of the supernatural realm will laugh and scoff at that. The atheists will say, that's ridiculous, that's nonsense. But you know what they say? They say the universe was formed in a trillionth of a second. At least the Bible gives it a couple days anyway. <laughs> you know, Big Bang. I've done that you know, science falsely so-called. I'm not going to get into that in depth. But listen, it's really hard for me to understand how somebody could believe in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, to, to believe in the atoning death and the sacrifice that he made, and, and deny that what the Word says about where sin came from. Because sin came when Adam and Eve, our, our first mother and father, tried to lift themselves up as God. That's what opened up the whole mess we're dealing with right now because the wages of sin is death that's why people die that's why stuff dies that's why our whole creation is groaning and moaning and deteriorating it's a law of physics that everything breaks down everything turns to dust and to dirt everything by faith I want to ask you this morning, do you believe by faith that God created everything in six days? Our faith ought to look like that. Amen. They'll call you names. I get it. I, I, I plant stuff. Uh, I put stuff on YouTube, you know. And I get, I'll, I'll say stuff on there sometimes, and people will come back and say, you stupid Christian, you dumb Christian, you dead. <laughs> you know. Well, you believe, you believe in a magical God, and, you, and they have all this stuff, and I say, you stupid atheist. Okay. <laughs> Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by God spoke everything into existence. 
He didn't have a factory where he was building everything. He spoke everything into existence. The only thing it says he really constructed was us. When he took the dirt of the ground and he breathed into it, and man became a living soul with the breath of God. He gave us his spirit. Thank you, Lord. He didn't give his spirit to the dogs and the cats and the birds and the squirrels. He gave his spirit to mankind. He made us. He didn't create them in his image. He created us in his image. That's what God's word says. And I'm going to believe it. And any PhD or whatever can call me whatever name they want, I'm going to stick with God's word. Hallelujah. That's faith. I believe that. You, I can't go back uh, 6,000 years or 10,000 years or 14 billion years. I, don't, I just believe what God's word says. Thank you. Thank you. By faith. I'm going to be, faith. I'm going to be faithful. I'm, I'm, that's, that's what my faith needs to look at because they under, he said they understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen are not, by made, not made by things which do appear. God spoke it. He said, light be, and light was. Okay? Look at verse 4. We see our faith believes in Bible creation. Our, also, our faith also should be, believe in a blood atonement. Listen to what he says. By faith, Abel, you remember him, don't you? We talked about him a few weeks ago when we were talking about building altars, making sacrifices. We know the story after the fall, after Adam and Eve sinned and everything changed. There came a time to worship God. They had two sons. One's name was Cain. One's name was Abel. You read about it in Genesis chapter 4. Again, a lot of folks will just dismiss that as folklore or just a fairy tale. But there were two sons. And Cain brought, uh, we've talked about this before, Cain, Cain brought an offering of fruits and vegetables and stuff he grew in his garden. Some good-looking tomatoes, you know. And said, God, here's, here's my garden, man. This, I, brought you, I, brought you the best, I brought you the best stuff I had that I grew. And God said, they ain't going to make it. So I don't, want, I don't want what you did. I don't want the works of your hands. I'm not interested in, in, in what a good gardener you are. I'm not interested in what a good singer you are, what a good preacher you are, what a good anything you are. I'm not interested in that. Abel brought a sacrifice of blood. It says in verse 4 that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, a better sacrifice. Why? Because it had blood. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. If God had to kill an, inc uh, an innocent animal to cover Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, listen, that's when you worship me, you give me thanks that I was willing to take a life to save yours. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. You see, Abel didn't know about the cross. He didn't know about Christ. But he knew without the shedding of blood there was no remission of sin. So by faith, his, the substance and evidence of his faith was he was willing to take a lamb of his flock and offer it for his sins. He couldn't see ahead. He didn't know the whole, the whole end of the story. But he knew probably what his father Adam had taught him. And he brought the right sacrifice. It was a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaks. The blood of Abel still cries out from the ground. Because we all know the story. Cain became jealous. God gave him a chance to bring a right kind of sacrifice, and he didn't do it. And instead of shedding the blood of an innocent lamb, he shed the blood of his brother. Because he was envious. Look at verse 5. It says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We know the story of Enoch. If, again, if you go back to Genesis and read about Enoch, we found out that Enoch lived uh, several years before the flood, I think he was the great-grandfather of Noah, and I may be a little wrong on that genealogy, but Noah was in his line. And Enoch was raptured before the flood. God didn't allow him to die. He didn't see death. 
God just took him out. Enoch is a type, I believe, of the church because God's going to take the church out before the flood comes, okay? Before, the, before his wrath comes. But it says here that Enoch should not see death and was not because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. If you turn back to that story in Genesis, you find out that it says Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. See, our faith believes in Bible creation, our faith believes in the blood atonement, and our faith believes in a relationship. Our faith gives us a relationship with God, that we walk with Him, that we talk with Him, that we spend time with Him, just like we have a relationship with our family members, our loved ones, our wives, our husbands, our children. Our relationship with God is not just the give me, it's not hiding under the couch when we do something wrong. But it's a relationship. He walked with God. Just like Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening before the fall, Enoch walked with God. His faith, the substance of his faith, the evidence of his faith is God called him a friend. And God did not allow him to remain on this earth to see the judgment that was coming. He goes on further and talks about this. He says, but without faith, in verse 6, it is what? Impossible. You might believe in God. You might believe there's a God. That's good. Remember last week we read James said, you believe in God? Well, devil believe in God. <laughs> but having faith, putting your trust in Him, believing that it's His blood, that cleanses us, believing His promises that He's coming back for a, a bride without spot or wrinkle, a glorious church? Do you have faith in what He said? Do you just believe He's just out there just running things? Do you believe He cares about you personally? Everybody in this room, God knows your name. He knew you before you were born. And just like our brother shared the other night, He has another name for you. <laughs> he has another name for you. He hasn't told me what his name for you is. He hasn't even told me what his name for me is. <laughs> that relationship without faith, if you don't have that kind of faith, you're not going to please God. I don't care how many people you feed. I don't care how many churches you build. I don't care how many uh, missionary trips you go on. I don't care what you do. If you don't have faith to believe, you will not please him. That's a prerequisite. Yes, God blesses us when we do things, when we have faith in God, and we go forth in, in whatever God has called us, whether it be in a ministry or whatever it might be. Yeah, you can please God like that, but it's got to begin with faith. If you, if you don't have faith, you're just, you're just a hired hand. He says, without faith, in verse 6, it's impossible to please God. Now listen, here it is. Listen. For he that comes to God must believe, must. He that comes to God, you might believe. You should believe. No. You must believe what? That He is, that means that God exists, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We need to believe that if we have a relationship with God, God is going to bless us. And if we diligently pursue our relationship with God. I've used this example so many times. If you're married and you don't diligently pursue your relationship with your wife, it's not going to be a very happy marriage. A lot of men, they get married and they figure that's the end. <laughs> when woman gets married, she figures that's the beginning. <laughs> they don't get together. That's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not teaching about marriage. I just figured I'd throw that one in. You can. I won't charge you any extra for that. All right. Okay. That he is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay? Now. That's what our faith should look like. I want to ask you something. Are you diligently seeking God? Are you diligently seeking what his will is for your life? Are you diligently seeking him for, to help you in those areas of your life that you struggle with? The other day we went up to uh, Teen Challenge. We go up there fourth 
Saturday of every month. And, and I told them guys up there, you know what, people argue and they get all stressed out and they get all bent out of shape. They'll talk about, well, can you lose your salvation? I'm going to lose your salvation. Give your salvation up. Listen, it doesn't matter. If you're diligently seeking God, there's not a devil in heaven or hell that can take you out of God's hand. Diligently seek him. You don't have to worry about losing nothing. Okay. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah. He's another one they'd like to laugh at. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah. In the time of Noah, which, by the way, Jesus said the end times are going to be like the days of Noah. Everybody's thoughts was only wicked continually. That's what the Bible says. There's a wicked bunch on this earth. Don't know how many people inhabited the earth. There could have been a billion people on the earth at that time. We don't know. However many they were, they were all rotten. <laughs> they all turned their back on God. But there was one that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. His name was Noah. One righteous man. God said, Noah, build an ark. Noah said, well, I'm, I'm reading into it. Noah said, what's an ark? God said, Noah, it's going to rain. Noah says, what's that? It hadn't rained before that. I believe, and I've, I've said this before, I believe that before the flood, a lot of people wonder why people lived a long time. I've, you guys have heard me say this. I believe there was like a shroud over the earth of ice or water that protected them from the harmful rays of the sun, and that, you know, everything, the whole world was... Uh, very temp uh, temperate. There wasn't like ice caps on the North and South Pole. But everything was a very nice place to live and a pleasant place to live. And when it rained, when God said, I'm going to send rain, he took that trowel, he took that covering and turned it into water. Can you just imagine 40 days of this massive amount of water falling on the earth? God said, it's going to rain. Noah said, what's rain? God says, build an ark. He said, what's an ark? By faith... God warned him. He said, Noah, I'm going to send judgment. I've never seen judgment, God. I'm going to send rain. I've never seen rain, but I'm going to believe what you say about it. I don't know where there's going to be. I don't know where the flood is. But I believe what you say about it. We read elsewhere in the Word that Noah preached for 120 years. That's a long time. People get mad when I go over 12 o'clock. <laughs> he preached for 120 years. <laughs> Nobody listened to him. Well, I bet you he was ready to quit. You know, folks get in ministry and they preach and nobody listens to him and they figure, I'm going to go look for something else. He preached for 120 years. He believed God. He could have said after 50 years, he could have said, God, nobody's listening to me. They're making fun of me. I'm building this boat and they think it's a big joke. But he kept up. Why? Because he feared God. Listen, his faith, you know what his faith looked like? He knew that judgment was coming. I want to tell you something. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you've got to know in your heart that there's something coming on this earth like we've never seen before. There's something coming. I'll, I'll go a step further. There's some, there's some stuff coming to this nation that we've never seen before. Because we, we have not been faithful to God as a nation. The churches of this nation have not been faithful to God. You know what the Word says? Every idle word that comes out of our mouth will be judged. My. There's a whole lot of idle words coming out, a whole lot of mouths. Especially of people that say they love the Lord. It'd be one thing if you hear from somebody that says they don't even believe in God. But you got folks that standing behind Paul but saying a whole lot of idle words. You know, I, I like to put it like this. I really believe and this isn't necessarily in the Bible, but I believe that every word we say, God puts in a bottle. This is my own opinion. Every word we say, God locks it up in a bottle somewhere. And somewhere down the line, he's going to pour it out. <laughs> you need to watch what you say. You need to be careful what you say. Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, 
prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I want to ask you something. Have you prepared an ark to the saving of your house? I'm not talking about a flood. But is your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Are you going to take responsibility for your household to teach your kids and teach your wife and teach your husband? Are you going to, is, are you going to allow your faith, the substance of your faith, to be there for your family so they could see it, so they could see the proof and the evidence of it? It says when he did that, he condemned the world. See, Noah believed in judgment and grace. That God's going to send judgment and he makes a way out. There's a fella, and as I said, I, I uh, subscribe to some, some channels on YouTube, you know. Anybody here use you, YouTube? And there's a fella, I think he's down around Nashville. I'm not sure where he is. But he goes out on the street. And he'll go to like where they, they, they have like, you know, like have a console where they, where, where they have uh, concerts, okay? So, like, for us, it would be, well, Civic Green is not there anymore, but he goes to their, like, local concert place, and he'll set up a microphone in little PA, and he'll preach to the people going into the concerts. Now, if it were, like, 35 years ago, I would have laughed that guy silly. Because I used to go to them concerts. How many people remember going to the concerts down to Civic Green or down to Syria Mosque, you know? Well, he sets up in front of there, and he preaches judgment and grace. And, and he has friends videoing this. And, you know, almost 100% of the people, they'll either walk by, they'll laugh at him, they'll argue with him, they'll say, quit being so judgmental. God's word is judgmental. See, if I judge you by what I think, then I'm being judgmental. But if I hold up God's word and say what this says, then you don't have any argument with me. This is true. Judgment? People say, don't judge. Well, I ain't going to look my, down my nose at anybody, but I'm going to tell you what God's word says. You can take her to leave it. Noah preached for 120 years. He said, he said, flood's coming. He said, there ain't no such thing as a flood. Rain's coming. Wait, what's rain? We've never seen rain before. Noah believed what God said, but that, that population back then didn't until the raindrops started falling. And then they tried to get in the ark, but you know what? The door was closed. Our faith should have judgment and grace. Just a couple more and then we're going to close. Look at verse 8. By faith. Remember last week we said that Paul's example of saving faith was who? Abraham. James, his example of saving faith was Abraham. They both used the same scriptures. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now listen to what Hebrews has to say about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, did what? Obey. And he went out not knowing where he went. He left where he was, and he was heading for a, a place that he never, never heard of, never been to. They didn't have GPS back then. They didn't have road maps. He just took off. He believed God. God said, get up out of the place called Ur of the Chaldees, which is a place of idolatry. He said, get up out of there, and I'm going to take you to a place that you've never been, and I'm going to give you that land. He didn't get a brochure. It wasn't like a timeshare. He just got up, and he left, and he believed God. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place, he could have said, God, where do you want me to go? Is there a place? I mean, they have water there. They have food there. What's it? He didn't ask. He just got up and he left. He obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. That land of promise we know today to be what we would call the land of Israel. At that time it was called the land of Canaan. Dwelling in tabernacles or tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, God promised him that he would have uh, a nation uh, uh, that would come out of his loins. He never saw that. God promised him that would be his land, but he was always busy dwelling in tents. He would go from one place to another to another. 
It says in verse 10, For he looked for a city which has foundations, not a place with a tent, not a place with a... whose builder and maker is God. Abraham never found that city. He kept looking. But he never stopped believing. He never found that city. Look at verse 11. Look at his wife. Through faith also Sarah... Remember Sarah? She was barren. She was 90 years old. Never had a baby. God said, Sarah, you're going to have a baby. She laughed. God said, that's the baby's name. Isaac. That's what it means. Laughter. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength. I want to ask some of you, some of you seasoned saints here, if God was going to come to you and tell you you're going to have a baby. You would say, man, not me. I've had mine already. Do you think if God came to you and said, you're going to have a child, you would have to say, God, give me strength because <laughs> I ain't going to make it. I don't know what it's like to have a baby and I don't want to know. Don't describe it to me. Sarah herself received strength. And we know about Sarah. She laughed. She, she at first, she thought it was a joke. But she received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Sarah believed uh, that God was able to give her strength. She had strength and expectation. If you have faith, you need to depend on God for strength when you don't have strength in your own self. Just a couple more and we're going to close. Verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is uh, by the seashore innumerable. Out of Sarah and Abraham, these two old people came, the nation of Israel. Okay? Now. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they never saw the land of Canaan settled by their offspring. They never saw uh, Jacob. He had 12 sons and they had some kids, but he never saw a great nation. Yet they still believed. He says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. See, I keep telling people this. We, when, when people start talking about faith, some folks, they start talking about, you know, getting houses and cars and money and stuff and getting stuff. Listen, our faith isn't in what we got around here. Our faith is in what is yet to come. I mean, God can bless us with stuff. That's all right. We can pray for stuff. I'm not telling you not to do that. If you need something, pray for it. Ask God for it. But ultimately, our faith, when I die, I'm going to leave all my stuff behind. My, my faith is, is in eternity. Jesus didn't die to make me rich. He died to make me saved. My faith isn't rooted in stuff. My faith is rooted in Him. My faith is rooted in my eternity. What I can't see. I can't see eternity. I can't see where God is right now. But I know I'm going to be there. And that's going to, that, that turns into stuff, substance, and evidence in my life. Okay. He said, for they, they that say such things... Now let's read verse 13 again. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I'm just passing through. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. What are you looking for? What nation, what country are you looking for? What place are you looking for? And truly, if they had been mindful of where, where they came from, they might have opportunity to have return. But now they desire a better country. You know, if we start thinking about what we used to have before we knew the Lord, we might tempt ourselves to want to go back there. That's what happened, that's what happened to the Israelites when they were coming out of Egypt. Things got a little tough. They got tired of eating manna every day. And they started thinking back of Egypt. Oh, I remember leeks and onions and garlic. Sounds good to me. I like garlic and onions. Never had too many leeks. But. Oh, we remember. They didn't remember the slavery. They didn't remember the chains or the cruel taskmasters. They just remember what filled their bellies. See, true faith doesn't look back. Faith looks forward. Doesn't look back to what I used to be. Doesn't look back to the stuff I had or the money I made. Or the, it doesn't look back to that. True faith looks ahead to what's coming. That's what they were looking for. 
They desire a better country, he says in verse 16, a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Listen, God has prepared for us a city. Jesus said, let not your heart to be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For where I go, I prepare a place for you. That where I come, there you may be also. He's made a place for you. If you're his, he's made a place for you. One more. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham again. When he was tried, you remember when he was tried? God said, Abraham, after, after living a hundred years, after, after having a son, his wife of his old age having this son that was going to be the heir of the promise, God said, I want you to take him and take him up on top of Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham didn't balk. He didn't argue. He didn't. He said, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Please grab a hold of that one. If you don't remember anything else, remember that one. Because it goes on and says, Of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting, listen, what, what was Abraham thinking when he offered up his son Isaac? What, was it just like a mindless, stupid obedience? No. He says that he, accounting, that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Listen, Abraham believed in the resurrection. If you have true faith, you're going to believe in the resurrection. If you have real faith, you're going to believe that you're going to live forever somewhere in your body. That's what faith looks like. That's the substance. Somebody says, well, when you die, are you going to become an angel? No. I'm not going to be an angel. When you die, are you going to get wings? No. When I die, here's what the Word says. When I die, when they put my body in the ground, or wherever they put it, my spirit goes to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? Thank the Lord. I'm not going to lay in that grave. I might put this body down there. I'm done with it anyhow. I'm getting tired of it. It's, getting, it's wearing out. But there's going to come a time that the trump is going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise. There's going to come a time when this body, when they bury it in the ground, is going to rise it's going to hear that trumpet? And we're going to sing that song, Ain't No Grave. My body will rise up out of the ground or wherever it is, in the ocean and wherever it is. And it will be reunited with my spirit. And you know what? Old Carmen's going to live forever. And you know what? I'm going to live forever in the presence of my God. You know why? Because I've been good? Oh, ask my wife, she'll tell you. I haven't because, because I've been, uh, because I'm a preacher, there's going to be a whole lot of preachers burning in hell. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to live forever in the presence in my body in that heavenly city called New Jerusalem because Jesus Christ shed his blood for me on the cross, and that's where my faith is. That's what I'm believing in. I wasn't back there 2,000 years ago to see him die on the cross, but I know he did. I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't back there to see when they whipped him and beat him and put the crown of thorns on his head. But I know that they did. And because they did, I ain't, af I ain't afraid of dying. Because they did, I know where I'm going. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. Brother, that's the bottom line. That's it. What's your faith in today? What do you believe today? You believe in God? Okay, devils believe that. But is your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ today? That's the question. Let's go, go home and, and read through it again. Get an idea of what picture, what you ought to look like as a believer. Say, do I look like that? And if there's something in there that you don't look like, then you say, God, make me look like this. Make me look like this. I want to look like what you want me to look like. I want to ask you this morning, do you look like that? I mean, don't answer me. It's none of my business. But between you and God, do you look like that? I want to ask you to stand with me. Oh.
the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as Who do you look like this morning? I mean, we all know what we look like. We look in the mirror and we can see what we look like. But I'm talking about in your spirit. I'm talking about in your heart. What do you look like this morning? See, I, I can only look at myself. I can only look at myself through God's word. And I can look at those things and I say, do I really? Do I really believe? Do I Do I really? I want to ask you this morning, do you really believe? Are you really grab a hold of God's word? I say that because there's such a time coming on this earth. It says over in Peter that there's a shaking coming. It begins here. Actually, it begins right here. And it it goes out there. Then it will go out there. There's a shaking coming. Are your feet on the solid rock? Do you know what you believe? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that each and every one in this place who have heard this message so poorly spoken will somehow, Father, that you would take your spirit and quicken not my words, but your word to each and every one of our hearts. God, we want to be ready when you come back. We want to be ready, Lord, if tomorrow is our day to die. We want to be ready. Because we don't know when you're coming back. But Lord, we know that everyone in here someday is going to die. It's one-on-one. Father, I pray that everybody in this room will get a hold of what your word says. And that we would examine ourselves. 